So welcome Carla. Um, Carla's going to be talking to us today about her new paper with her colleagues on the challenge of rich vocabulary instruction for children with developmental language disorder. So Carla, if you wouldn't mind, can you tell us a little bit about what your paper is about? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to, Sean. Um, thanks for having me. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about the study. So this is a study that I did with my colleagues, Amanda Van Horn, Mara Curran, Susan Wagner Cook, and Renee Cole. Um, and we are, um, well, between us, a group of speech language pathologists and psychologists. Um, actually, Renee Cole is a, um, she's a chemist who specializes in science education. And so um, we're a group who came together because we're really interested in children's learning of scientific concepts uh, very early on, the preschool science curriculum kinds of um, issues. But in particular, we realized that the science of language, um, or I'm sorry, I should, I should switch that around. The language of science um, is very complex. So in order to talk about science, uh, we tend to use complicated grammar, like um, uh, to make predictions, like if I push on the lever, this will happen. So like if then kinds of instructions. And then of course there's the scientific vocabulary itself, um, which can be rather complex. Um, those words tend to be longer. So even complex in the logical form, but especially complex in the semantic nature of the words as well. And so we became very curious about how children with BLD would cope with the preschool science curriculum if you imagine that um, their language is more limited than other preschoolers. And so we um, were fortunate enough to get funding from the National Science Foundation in the US to fund a project that um, really has three intervention arms. And we're going in to see if helping these children with their vocabulary or their grammar compared to science only manipulation is helpful. And so this particular paper um, is not the overall, it's not a report of the overall project, but it's a kind of a, a zoom in to the details of the science and vocabulary part of the study. So it's a, a case series. Um, we followed seven children during the science summer camp uh, that we run where we collect the data and we did some pretty detailed observations of their response to this intervention and the paper presents um, I, I'd say both our, uh, our successes and our, our failures um, in providing that intervention in a way that's workable for the children. Carla, what would be some of your key findings from this paper, this, um, you know, zoomed in focus um, as a part of your broader research study? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're really only talking about seven children, right? This is a case series. Um, but even though we are only studying seven children in this particular piece of the project. There was so much variability. So we had fairly good learners, and then we had um, we had children who didn't seem who couldn't at least find measurable learning at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's I suppose well, it's disappointing, but it's not it, it's not surprising in the sense that the literature um, that presents more general group level findings also finds a lot of variability in response to intervention. Um, so that was a key finding. I think trying to really dig deep and, and start to think about why there's so much variability in response to intervention was a key finding. So we feel like um, children who have a variety of risk factors coming together are the most vulnerable. So all of the children in the intervention had DLD. So we can't say, you know, that was the driving factor. Um, but some of them also were from um, really um, extreme um, circumstance of poverty and had a lot of stressors in their lives and their family and their home um, associated, we think, with, with living in poverty. Um, and some of them also had some pretty, um, notable problems with executive function. So um, um, attention, um, inhibition, working memory, uh, which we measured, um, but also could even readily absorb. And so it, it seemed like our, our weakest learners or the children who responded the, the um, 
um, the least to the intervention were children who not only had DLD, but maybe also had a lot of um, issues related to poverty and executive function. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, our strongest learners, um, uh, again, had DLD, they all had DLD. Um, older, which I think probably relates, so these were all preschoolers, but their age range was still four to six. And that's a, those are pretty significant uh, periods of growth, those two years, right, four to six. And our, our oldest child was uh, among the very best responders. I think, I think he was the best responder, actually. And, and that suggests to me perhaps more experience in um, um, you know, kindergarten-like settings, um, um, probably better executive function just by virtue of development. Um, and he was also very interested in science. And I think you know, finding the child's interest area and really uh, leveraging that for the benefit of the intervention uh, can be a powerful thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I think that's a really fascinating finding actually. What we know around engagement is growing and we know that the more interested they are in a topic that the more likely they are to develop and consolidate those skills. Um, but of course, you know, looking at those factors that you've identified are really key. Are there any takeaway messages you feel clinicians, um, even families who might be listening to the vlog, um, might be interested in, in learning so that they can apply that in their own lives or day-to-day -day work? I think an important message for clinicians, and, and we try to make this point in the paper itself, is that um, children who respond modestly or um, uh, perhaps even fail to respond at all to, to language interventions. Um, I, those, those children are um, they're telling us something about what DLD is, right? So I, I think um, children who don't respond well to interventions, it, it's a diagnostic sign. It's a sign of, I think, how severe their problem is. I mean, if, if these were children who just readily soaked up words from the world around them, then we wouldn't have diagnosed them and we wouldn't put them in special interventions. But even among children who, who um, receive diagnoses of DLD, I think there can be children who um, respond more readily to interventions and, and children who don't. So I think that's sort of a diagnostic or maybe perhaps more accurately a prognostic sign in terms of how readily they respond, how malleable um, their learning is when you really get in and, and dig deep. Um, so that's, I think, one important message. Um, but you know, to be a bit more hopeful, um, these are big words. So I actually thought for a little bit about calling, about titling the paper, Little Kids Big Words, because and maybe I showed up because I still think that's sort of cute, but um, these were big words. You know, these were, these are four to six year old children, um, but they're learning words like, you know, predict and hypothesis, right? And, and they did make gains and they did make gains on the science concepts too. So this paper is just about the vocabulary works they learned, but they also gained some knowledge of scientific concepts and processes. And so I, I think um, at the same time, it can be a struggle for some children to respond to an intervention, they'll do it slowly. Um, we also can see that they do learn and they do grow in response to these enriched activities. So I think that's, there's a positive there as well. I think that that's something that we're seeing coming through the literature more is that children with DLD have the capacity to learn, but they mm -hmm. often need a slightly differentiated way of doing it, which I think is the positive from that research. You know, I think yes. that it's, they can and do learn. It's how we support them to do that. Yeah, I think the, the most effective interventions, and I mean, I think any good clinician can tell you this, I don't need to tell you this, but the most effective interventions are those that are well tailored to the needs of the individual child and they can be quite quite individual needs. You know, they can quite differ uh, quite a bit from one child to another. Um, so yeah, um, they, they need to be activities that the child's engaged in. Uh, dosage turned out to be important. So the words that we modeled and explained and, and um, um, have the children um, think about uh, more often were, not surprisingly, the words that they tended to learn. So dosage is important. I think um, an engaging context is important. Um, I think that uh, there are some things that weren't ideal about our intervention because it, it ultimately was a piece 
a, a case study series that we took out of an RCT, a randomized control trial. We had to be somewhat one size fits all in terms of what we were teaching to the children. And I think in, in truer clinical practice, um, we would have been more individualized. I think some of these words were not the words that these children needed. Um, we also talk about in the paper, um, the idea of working on uh, tier one versus tier two words. So um, um, people who read the literature on vocabulary teaching and interventions know that tier two words for school children anyway, are, are these words that are um, they're academic, but they're very useful like the word predict. So you can find the word predict across multiple um, subject areas, right? Um, so you might predict in math class and science class and, and I don't know, maybe art class, if you're predicting what colors <laughs> you're gonna have when you mix. Um, so these are very useful words, but also you know fairly academic in nature. And so we like to teach them because we think that it helps children access the curriculum. And I think that probably is true for most children. Um, are, are behind to the extent that they actually could use some support with tier one words as well. And those are words that feel like more basic vocabulary, like um, oh, uh, names of everyday objects or emotions like happy and sad or you know, things that um, we don't really think of as, as related to school topics so much, but are obviously really important for functioning in the real world. Um, and so that could have also played into some of the uh, more limited responses to the intervention is that we went tier two for everybody because that was the project we were meant to, uh, we were meant to test. Mm. Well, it sounds particularly interesting. I'm really looking forward to hearing how the rest of the study progresses. Um, but thank you so much for your time, Carla. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I love talking about it. You can always count on me to Babylon about my work. <laughs> so I'll be back one day. <laughs>